Friday's the deadline for state prosecutors to turn over all investigative genetic genealogy or IgG material related to the case against Brian Koberger. Koberger is the man accused of murdering four University of Idaho students last November. The judge wants to review the IgG material to determine what needs to be turned over to Koberger's defense. His team is worried about how police built a family tree and linked Koberger to the DNA on the knife sheath officers found at the house on King Road near the University of Idaho campus. They say they need the information to get their defense ready for trial. But prosecutors say they didn't use the genetic family tree to get any warrants and they won't be using it as evidence at the trial. A deadline is now set for prosecutors to turn over evidence against the man who is accused of killing four University of Idaho students last year. Grim 2 Shannon Mowdy explains the decision that came down in a Lata County court this morning. Shannon? Now this all revolves around a huge piece of the case, investigative genetic genealogy, which the state says was used to develop the first leads that pointed to suspect Brian Koberger. In what could signal a win for the defense, Lata County Judge John Judge says the state must turn over all investigative genetic genealogy or IgG material by December 1st. I'm asking to, to look at all this because I can't make informed decisions if I don't. The judge wants to review it all privately to determine what to turn over to Brian Koberger's defense team. In an October 25th order, he ruled they showed at least some of that material is essential to building a case. Citing filings from prosecutors, the judge says the FBI used a DNA profile found on a knife sheath at the scene, uploaded it to public genetic databases, and used social media, birth and death certificates, and other public info to build a family tree, which later led to Koberger. The defense has asked for all the info on how investigators did this testing. But I think that there's missing information from the Osram's profile that we have. I'm hoping the court gets it, and I certainly understand that the court needs to see everything to make a decision. My hope is that everything includes communication so that you can follow the path of what happened. The state has argued the FBI didn't directly compare DNA from the sheath to Koberger's DNA, and the genetic genealogy testing won't come up at trial. Prosecutor Bill Thompson voiced concern the defense has false assumptions. There, there are items that she thinks ought to be there that do not exist. But I don't think that the lawyers ought to get into the guessing game with what should and shouldn't be there, particularly since it is our position the defense has a fundamental misunderstanding of the difference between pro SNF profiles and traditional DNA comparisons and how that process works. We are not trying to mislead the court. We have been absolutely clear and we've relied on the Department of Justice policy and our expectations. Thompson says he's already notified the FBI it needs to turn over everything it has. Let's start where we know we have things and then we can go from there. But Thompson warned it could take a month to get the FBI documents as a request has to go through the bureaucracy of the Department of Justice. Now this all revolves around a huge piece of the case, investigative genetic genealogy, which the state says was used to develop the first leads that pointed to suspect Brian Koberger.
Yes, sir. I'd be happy to. And and to start, I, Mr. Lodgeson said something that I think needs to be addressed. He makes the allegation the state is trying to kill someone here, and frankly, I find that offensive. What the state is trying to do is to enforce the law that our legislature has put in place. It says, in cases such as this, with facts like this, a jury is entitled to decide not only guilt, but potential filming. We are simply trying to fulfill our responsibilities under the law. For right now, the case against the man accused of killing four University of Idaho students is heating up. Brian Koberger's defense team now questioning whether the evidence against him is admissible in court. All right, so Fox 13's Maria Garcia joining us now with more on the questions his attorneys are raising at this point. Hi, Maria. Good morning. Brian Koberger was back in court yesterday for a hearing that lasted about 30 minutes, and his attorney asked the court to order prosecutors to turn over more evidence. Koberger's defense wants phone records and training records for three investigators and information on why the FBI expanded the range of model years of the white Hyundai Elantra that they were looking for in connection with this case. Koberger's car initially fell outside of the range that authorities were publicly trying to track down. His defense team also wants access to records about how investigators handled the DNA in the case. The defense claiming the genetic genealogy methods used by the FBI are inadmissible. Police say their evidence places Koberger near the crime scene and cameras show a car similar to his in the neighborhood days before the killings. They say Koberger used his cell phone at least 12 times in the neighborhood before the stabbings. All of this evidence could mean the death penalty for Koberger, something a father of one of the victims is pushing for. I'm glad that we're in a situation of strength and uh, the evidence is there and we feel that we can, you know, they can go forward with this. Okay, so this is where we stand now. A judge ruled the prosecution must turn over all of their evidence by July 14th. Meanwhile, work crews have started preparing the house where those murders took place for demolition. Crews will spend the next few weeks removing personal items for the family to take with them if they choose to. The victim's landlord originally donated the six-bedroom rental to the university, which has since decided to demolish the home, and the school says that it does plan to create a memorial on campus to honor the victims. For now, I'll send it back to you, Liz. On each side, mom and dad. The court can imagine that there are a lot of documents that must be collected and examined and reviewed so that we are aware of things that we would need to present to our jury if we ever got to that phase. We have had a lot of trouble collecting documents. Sometimes it takes a court order to get documents. Sometimes documents are missing. Sometimes they're very old and you have to piece things together. We're working through it, but I want the court to know it takes some time for that as well. There are records yet to be obtained that we need in both sides. There are still experts yet to be hired that we need to find an expert that has the right expertise and will work on the case with us. Um, we do have several working with them, but there are still more that need to be found. And then let's come back to the discovery. Um, I want to talk about some of the difficulties with discovery, and I want everybody to know that I am not disparaging the state when I say this. I'm describing a complication, a challenge, probably one that the state shares. In this case, we began asking for supplemental discovery in February of 2023. We had some initial discovery and then we started looking at it and asking for other discovery. We are up to our 11th request for discovery and there's I think 250 items total with subparts to that. The state will respond to us, they're not ignoring us, I'm not saying that at all. There's just a lot out there. But this is complicated because this the discovery that we receive the materials, there's videos, there's interviews, there's police reports, there's photographs, 13,000 photographs that come in and they are not indexed. 
So you get a discovery file and there's tons of sub files. And I believe this is the way the state's getting it too. And I believe this is complicated because we have multiple law enforcement entities that have been working on the case. And I believe they filter discovery through one of the entities and then it gets to the prosecutor. And I think they're hurrying as fast as they can to get the discovery to us. But so I think they're giving it to us as they get it but there's no indexing in it. So you must open each of those files and see what you have. And you might have police reports in sequence, and then you might not. And you might have photographs, but you don't know which officer took them. You can tell where they are, but you don't know which officer, and you don't know what day because the officers were in that residence multiple times. So that's complicated to try to match all of those things up. There are things that we've asked for that have taken, it's just taken a long time. The court knows we've had motions to compel and we've had some pretty lively debates about what certain things that we should have and certain things that we, they don't want us to have for other reasons. Those things take time as well. We don't have complete discovery. I don't think the state has complete discovery. But we definitely don't have complete discovery. I'll give you a couple of examples. We have, there is a, a video that's a really important video and we early on received some of it. And we are still waiting for the complete of it. The court would know from our 11th discovery request that there's still outstanding portions of that video that we need to have. And I think the state's working through it, trying to match up video and sound together for the completion, the full, uh, several days worth of video, but there's not even an estimated day when we'll get that. And that is critical for us to review and hear all of that. So that, that's an example, Your Honor, that is not us saying, we just don't wanna to go to trial, we just wanna drag our feet. That is us saying there are critical things that we don't have. I am very concerned about expert reports. We don't have, we have a draft of one, the cast report. The court had ordered that we receive the cast report. It's a draft. I don't think the state has it. I don't think they're sitting back on it, but I don't have that yet. And there are completed materials all over the place like that, that we just don't have. Our team speaks with the prosecution team fairly regularly about these issues. We communicate by text and by email about things like this that are coming up. We've sat down and spoken with them. They're very open to talking to us, but this just isn't a closed deal. There has to be a deadline on discovery. There has to be a target date where that ends. And then there has to be time to make sure that we've read every piece of it, watched all the videos, looked at all of the photographs and know where they came from. A few months from now is not a sufficient amount of time to do that. There is no possible way I can even read or watch everything I have now or react to things that are still coming in if we're to have a deadline in time for a summer of 2024 trial. Your Honor, I want to also talk about some of the other deadlines. One of the things in the state's motion for scheduling order had to do with um, the alibi defense. And as a court remembers, we had made some submissions and we needed more information before we could do anything more complete. We're still in that circumstance. Um, but when the court vacated its scheduling order last fall, that was part of the scheduling order that was vacated. So the state asserts in its scheduling order that our time has expired. And that just can't be because the court didn't carve that out and say, I'm going to vacate everything but this. So we'll need a new date. But I'd ask the court to be really mindful of the other information we need. We need the cast report. We need other information um, of things that past agents and other specialists with the FBI might have done with cell towers and records. And I don't have all of those yet. I have some. And the state has pointed me to places that they believe I have more that maybe I missed in the discovery, and I'll look at those. But I'm going to need some time to do that. I wanted to let the court know as well, because the court's going to be considering a scheduling deadline for 12B motions. I want us to have a clear picture before we have that deadline. 
And the clear picture that I'm concerned about is the state's pathway of how Brian Koberger comes to their attention and is identified. I've read that PC affidavit over and over and over again, and I'm not sure. I, over a year into this case and everything I've read, and I'm, I've spoken with our team, we're not sure how the state decides on Brian Koberger. I know different pieces, but I don't know where they fit together. And the more work I do, the less I know about how they fit together. And that is critical for us to assess 12B motions. So while the court's doing deadlines for discovery, I need the court to have something with the 12B keyed on when I have full discovery. I also think it would be appropriate for the court to allow windows to file additional motions based on later disclosed materials too. I, I, I think we'll just keep getting materials until the court sets a deadline for it to be cut off. Not anybody's fault, just the magnitude of the case. And so I think that would be something appropriate for the court to set as well. That covers it. Thank you. What, one more question. So sure. I, I understand this. I mean, I'm aware of the amount of disc disclosures uh, already. Um, but do we need a whole nother year after this summer? I mean, it, it, can I help everybody by having tighter deadlines to make things happen faster so that we can get this uh, trial sooner? That's a, that's a tough question. Um, no. if, if I have, if the state says you have everything in the, and I believe they could say I have everything they have, but I, I know there's other things out there. I, I know it based on responses to discovery. If I had absolutely everything, all their experts reports, I would still need a period of time to read and understand that. It, there's not a shortcut for the amount of time that it takes to go through everything. There's just not a shortcut for that. Having a deadline for discovery helps me. It, it just does. Having a des a deadline for expert disclosures, that absolutely helps me as well. Um, I have the concerns of discovery that's not yet made available. I have the concerns of the time it takes to review all of the materials. And I have the concerns about the limitations we're finding with people being willing to talk to us, both for the innocence phase and the mitigation phase, should we ever get there. I have significant concerns. We're working on it. Um, if you could say, everything's going to go according to plan, I'm going to give you these deadlines, and all of the materials will be in the state's hands so they can give them to you, and the records you need will be given to you when you ask, and the witnesses that you need to speak with won't slam the door in your face, if you could tell me that, then I would say I could be ready by March of 2025. And that's me saying I'm going to spend every possible hour on Mr. Koberger's case, which I've been doing and which I'm willing to continue to do. And so is the rest of his team. So let's go to Mr. Thompson see what you have to say about all this. Just getting getting things ready for trial. Uh, Ms. Taylor is not understating the amount of work that's involved in this case, Judge. Um, I think that's fair to say, and there's more information that continues to be developed. You know, it's kind of like you ask one question, you get an answer, and that leads you to another question. I know that um, Ms. Taylor and, and her co-counsel uh, and investigators are encountering that. We are trying to provide things as quickly as we can, and she's right. Uh, there are delays in, in with the multiple agencies getting everything together. The tips, for example, were part of a nationwide tip line that needed to be completely shut down before we could get all the tips that were in it. Uh, and so that's why it took so long with these 9,000. I, I didn't count them, but I, there are thousands and thousands of tips, most of which are out there. But you're right, most, most of all of which need to be looked at. It's a decision that pulls me in two, two different. I appreciate that, Judge. Yeah. 
Um, I'm upset right now. I mean, I'd, I'd like to get a little closer uh, with Discovery and see if we can have that more quickly. I'd like to speed it up if it's possible. So I'd really like to do this sooner than later. I mean, maybe in March uh, 2025, uh, which Taylor, that would be that would be a reach. Um, I just want to let it percolate a little bit. I know everybody probably here, including council, want want to direct a certain date. But when you're talking about a date so long in the future, potentially, um, maybe we can. Maybe we can get to a point where we can move it more quickly. I'm not going to just let it hang for too long, but it's just, it's really hard for me right now to set something in 2025, even though that might be just the reality. And I know that there's lots of other issues to be addressed. I know there are going to be a lot of motions. There's going to be a lot of motions about the death penalty as well. So it's brutalizing to, to think that we have to have a case so far in the future. But if that's what is the right thing for everything to do it correctly? Uh, maybe we only have to do it one time. Because we don't want to do this twice. We don't want to do this three times. Because you know, you know, um, no matter what happens, okay, if he's convicted, it's going to be appeal, 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 and. Uh, that's also a challenge. So my heart goes out to the victims. I I can't even imagine the the pain, the grief, um, because you can't really go forward with your life without is hanging over your head. So I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 